As you know, Client Success is a customer success management platform that helps leaders and CSMs retain and grow their customer base through communication and collaboration across the customer journey. And I am very excited to welcome Bill Cachard to the webinar today. We will hear from him. Uh, Bill works for Service Rocket. Service Rocket is a SaaS platform with a mission to help companies grow by speeding the adoption of their software. And Bill is a dynamic speaker and a recognized customer success strategist and thought leader. We're very excited to have Bill with us today. Today's webinar is designed to be a collaborative session, so we encourage you to use the Q&A feature and the chat within the webinar to submit questions. Bill and I will stop at a couple of points in the presentation and we'll also uh, save some of your questions for the end of the session. We will also be recording the entire webinar today and it will be sent to your inbox later this week. So it's my pleasure to welcome Bill Cachard. Bill, we're excited to hear from you. Hi, Brent. Yeah, it's great to be here. I'm honored uh, that you get to spend some, I get to spend some time with you in the audience. So that's great. I can't wait. So for those of you who don't know uh, what we do at Service Rocket, Brent is right. We uh, are obsessed with software adoption and we do that uh, in many ways, the most important way we believe is with education, of course, since I am a hammer, everything looks like a nail. But our product LearnDot is a learning platform that allows software companies to set up and run a business of education function to help customers learn their software. And that could be part of an onboarding process and or could be part of an ongoing program of helping your customers not only learn your product, but in some cases actually help them learn how to run, learn, help their customers achieve the outcomes that they've bought your software to help them achieve. So that's just a little bit about LearnDot. But I wanna get right into the topic because the topic for today is how to design a customer education strategy. And I really think strategy design is a thing. And if it's not a thing, it should become a thing in a hurry. Because imagine yourself in, in life without a strategy, just in general. For one thing, you don't know where you're going, and you have, so you have no focus, right? Because if you have no strategy, you, know, if like you don't know which road to take, any turn will take you there. Uh, but also without a strategy, you also don't know what to do or even how to do it, right? So it's one thing not to know where you're going but a strategy can help you even figure out the how. So imagine not even knowing how to do something. And so I have this point of view where a strategy, and if you know how to design one, can always help you answer the questions that your executive teams pose to you about how we're going to solve the problems we're trying to solve, whether that's grow the business or improve our renewals or improve customer satisfaction and NPS scores. Um, Sometimes our, our executive team and CEOs make demands on us to solve this. And in the moment, we don't know what to say. And we just go work hard. But I believe that knowing how to design a strategy in a certain way in this process that I want to show you today, I believe it will help you calm your heart rate during those discussions because you know that you can fall back on this process and then provide a proper answer. And even if the answer is not perfect, the answer you come up with with a strategy design helps you have grown up intelligent business conversations with executive teams to negotiate changes to your original answer in a way that will impress executive teams. So I want you to come with me on this journey. I'm going to tell you three stories about three companies that have had some sort of a customer challenge and how they solved it. So let's take one example of Docker, the software container company, and DevOps and release engineers use Docker to uh, build and ship software. Some of you may know who, what Docker is. It's a very fast-growing technology and company. But in 2014, this is a staggering story. Uh, you can find this article on VentureBeat. In 2014, there were 2,500 job listings 
that wanted someone who knew how to use Docker in some way or another. One year later, that number was 43,000. So this Docker technology took off like crazy. And pr pretty soon, there were tens of thousands of job listings that needed it. So imagine you're an account executive calling in on companies to sell them the, you know, the premium or professional version of Docker because, you know, Docker is an open source technology. So anybody can get it for free. But imagine you're trying to sell the premium version, that, which has additional features and support and all that the usual open source selling model. And imagine you call in and prospects say to you, I can't buy Docker. I don't even have enough people that know how to use it. I'm trying to hire people and I can't hire them fast enough. So why don't you wait and maybe someday if I hire people, I'll buy Docker. Um, so obviously this is a problem that can be, that needs to be solved so that Docker can grow as a business, right? Because if, if there's a challenge in selling the product because no one knows how to use it, then how are you going to grow a business? This next company, Wyden, is in the digital asset management space. And their MPS, when they started on this endeavor, this is a big problem to solve. Many of you might be able to relate to this. Uh, you know, this MPS score, you know, maybe it's not zero, but it's certainly not 60, for example. And Wyden wants to improve this because of the high correlation between MPS score and, and growth and revenue. All right. So this is obviously a problem that Wyden wants to solve. Now, let me take you to a third story outside of software to demonstrate, to help demonstrate the point. Fender Guitars also has an adoption problem. Now, what you might be thinking, does Fender Guitars have to do with SaaS software? Well, hear me out for a moment. In the last 10 years, the sales of electric guitars has dropped 40%. That's 1.5 million guitars per year 10 years ago, and now that number is 1 million. So imagine in your business, uh, c c growth in sales is falling that steadily over that extended period of time. That is not a good place to be. Fender did some research and also found out that during the, and, and SaaS software companies can relate to this to some extent, that during the first 12 months that someone buys a guitar, 90% of people quit. So they buy a guitar and within 12 months they stop playing. So that is not a sustainable business model. And even though I'm not subscribing to a guitar service or I get a new guitar every month for 422 bucks a month subscription, that is a person that won't go back to the guitar store and buy strings and amplifiers and wires and headphones and microphones and maybe even a second guitar one day. So imagine you sitting in your office with a high number of customers that purchase your software and then within one year they just don't renew because they're not using it. So now I'm gonna ask you a question and you can type these into the chat box if you want, but what's common among these stories do you think? And we can proceed on while you do that, but type that in. What do you see as, you, as common among these three stories, even though one is a guitar, guitar company? Well, how about I answer the question by saying, each of these three companies deployed some customer education strategy to help solve or improve on their current situation. So, and one thing to note, I'm not suggesting that the customer education problem was the solution to their problems. In a minute, I'm gonna show you what some of the results are. But I am suggesting that customer education was one of the interventions that each of these three companies deployed. Okay, so let's talk about Docker for a minute. We saw the stats of the number of job descriptions, uh, job requirements for Docker going up 1,700% in one year. If you look at this chart, this is from Datadog, you know, that sort of monitors product use, among other things. But there have this, the stats that from, look at the adoption in 2014 in the far left side of this chart at about the same time, uh, right before the Docker job requirements started to shoot up. Um, Docker deployed an education strategy that started with uh, video training on their website that was not gated, 
that didn't require signing in, didn't require you to be a customer. They had a training.docker.com and on the front page at that time was um, several uh, detailed and in-depth courses, self-paced, on-demand, that anybody could take. So Docker, to address this problem of, oh my gosh, this growth is happening and we need to help people learn it so they can buy it, that's the strategy they took. Now, over time, and you can see on this chart what the adoption, uh, what happened with the adoption over time, among other things they did. But you can imagine then that after they deployed video, they started to say, hey, this education might be a contributor. So Docker went on to develop training for their partner ecosystem so that partners could go out and help customers set up, configure, deploy, and learn Docker. Um, and then they started doing live training on top of that with customers as well. So that over time, they did build up a much broader education program. But at the beginning, it was it was self-paced. It was on demand. It was no friction. It was here's some videos on how to use our software, and they wanted everyone to learn it. Let's talk about Wyden University. Laurel and Lexi are rock stars. You can imagine they, what a, what a two-person team can do in this example when they started Wyden University to address to help address that NPS problem. And look at some of these results. NPS went up 19 points. Wow. Imagine if you running some sort of an education function could claim that, hey, we contributed to that. That's a big number. But they found that the education also improved the sales cycle and increased the sale funnel velocity. They increased the number of leads and close rates went up too. Because what happened is customers are, and I should say prospects, but prospects are taking courses on Widen University before they become customers. And so they are more knowledgeable, number one, about what the product could do for them. But secondly, they get a taste of what it's like to work with Widen. It makes them a little, so not only are they slightly more knowledgeable about what the product can do, but they're also a little bit more comfortable working with a company like Widen because they've experienced trainers or content or the experience of signing in and taking a course and all that it makes the selling process a little bit easier because it's hard to buy software because it's, you know, some of you who have bought software at the enterprise level know that you don't really know what you're getting until after you buy. And so anything we can do to make that process a little more familiar uh, can certainly help that. But imagine you running education can also um, say in your career that programs I put in place to help customers learn our software, not only helped customer satisfaction and renewals, but helped front end new business sales velocity. That's pretty special. That's a resume builder for you. So let's talk about what Fender Guitar did. Just within the last 12 months, they launched Fender Play. And the reason why I like this example is that for two reasons. One, Fender, a company known for, it's a manufacturing and a retail company, really, isn't it? To sell a physical good, not software. But they took a, an online education, a digital approach to this adoption problem by setting up this online learning program called Fender Play. And it is not free. You subscribe. It's a subscription model. You subscribe. You pay a monthly fee. It's not that high. And it goes through lessons. And the point of these lessons, now this is the best part in my opinion. The lessons are not designed to teach you the features of a guitar which is what our software training often does because we don't teach you, look at this knob that adjusts the volume and look at this knob that tightens up your B string and look at this pickup. This kind of pickup makes a, produces a very particular sound. No, no. The, the goal here was to help people learn to play their favorite songs. That's the outcome because anyone that picks up a guitar wants to play Here Comes the Sun by the Beatles in front of their kids or their friends. Uh, sitting on the couch at home. That's what people want to do because it's fun. It's my favorite song. What if I could play that? So that's, they also took an approach of helping people achieve outcomes and not the features of the guitar. So that's a lesson for how we design our software. If you think that these three stories have been cherry picked to suggest that online learning helped these particular companies and it's not necessarily generalizable to everybody else, 
I want to show you some more stats that are more broad. If you don't know who TSIA is, the Technology Services Industry Association, I suggest you look them up. And I would start with the blog and go find blog posts written by Maria Manning Chapman, because she's doing a lot of work studying the impact of technology education services on software adoption. And these three stats are incredible. She has found that among TSIA member companies that customers that are completing education use the product more than customers that do not complete education. And we can all relate to that. We all want to improve product use. She's also found that not only do they use the product more and more often, means maybe I sign in three times a day instead of once a week, for example. She's also found that people the customers use more features and functions. And some of you know that you have sticky features, right? That once you know you get customers to use this feature or that feature, the likelihood that they will renew is much, much higher. So education can help people actually use more features in your products, which will make it more sticky. And finally, I have a question for all of you, and you could type into the chat. How many of you would like to have your customers work a little bit more independently than from calling you every day or calling your support teams. Uh, TSIA found out that customers work way more independently when they complete training than, than compared to their same customers that do not complete the training. And so that's ticket diversion, that's support call diversion, whatever you want to call it. But the point is customers are more independent when they do that. So I ask you, I've, dem I've shown you three stories and which with each with its own problem. So I want you to think about as we go through this three-step process of designing a strategy, what is your problem to solve? Not your personal problems like we all have. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about your, the challenges and problems that, that your business needs to solve in order for it to be more successful tomorrow than it is today. I want you to think about what that is because when we get into this process of designing a customer education strategy, we need the lens of looking at specific business problems we're trying to solve. So for about the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to walk through this three-step process of how to design a customer education strategy. And I'm calling this strategy design, and I'm calling this a thing, and I'm, hopefully it will become a thing where we, can, we all become strategy designers, and we put that on our LinkedIn profiles. But step one, it all starts with the goal. And that's, what, that's why I have this previous slide of what's your problem, because we want to set a goal to attack that problem. That's why it's important. Uh, the second step in this design process is to assess the current state of your education function. That could mean anything from we have none to we have a VP of education services and 12 people on the team and a $4 million budget and we're accountable to a number and anything in between. But we need to make an honest assessment of the current state of that. And then finally, step three is to create a roadmap that helps us get from here to there, whatever here is and whatever there is. So this fro twos, from twos, from here to there, that's what this roadmap will help us do. So are you ready to go through each step one at a time? I am. This is exciting. And uh, feel free to ask questions throughout. Uh, Brent uh, will interrupt me whenever... Uh, the questions are appropriate and all that, and I'm happy to be interrupted. So feel free to do that throughout the webinar. So let's talk about. Bill, before you jump. Yeah. Before you jump into the details here of step one, just a couple of interesting things. You know, you asked, uh, would you like your customers to be more independent? And I think uh, that yes. was our most responded to question I've ever seen <laughs> with a oh, thousand yeah. yeses. So, uh, so you're definitely um, touching on the right things there. Uh, it, it maybe it would be appropriate before you jump into these uh, to just comment briefly if you know on Docker or or any of the other stories you've you've mentioned um, how how are they ensuring that people actually watch their videos or or use their training materials? Well, there's I mean that's the that's not exactly a soup question, is it? But there's lots of ways to do that and. The first is understand that you really can't make anybody do anything. So it is a constant battle to beg and plead and wish and promote and market 
to customers that this exists. In fact, some customers, some companies will launch education program and go a year and are baffled that customers don't know it exists, right? And even though they might say, hey, we've sent out 27 emails and we've had four webinars and we have pop-ups in, in the product, you know, in-app messages that say so. However, I will say this. One is you need to measure it. So somehow, whether you're just tracking it in go-to training registrations um, or whether you actually go out and buy an LMS, which can help automate some of the enrollment and completion tracking for you, and even integrate and send that tracking back into Salesforce or into a customer success product, for example. First thing is you have to measure it so that you can know if it's not happening because it, then if you know, you could do something about it, right? Um, but one way is to promote it like crazy. Um, an, you know, customer marketing, uh, in-app notifications, email subscriptions, customer webinars. So for existing customers that already have been paying you for a year or two or three, uh, you, you can have this campaign to promote it. For new customers, you could require it, meaning it's part of our onboarding. In other words, if you design an onboarding program, step three in the onboarding is attend the training. And we don't go to step four until you complete step three, attend the training. Now, of course, how do you force a customer to not allow them to go to step four without doing step three because someone was sick that day and you don't want to slow them down. But if it's part of your standard onboarding, that's another way to get people to uh, attend the training. Uh, another way is to charge for it. The worst thing you can do is say, hey, training is free, and then expect people to add, uh, think that it's valuable. That's one thing to, so our point of view at Service Rocket, and mine in particular, is that, that training takes effort, training takes time, and if, as long as it's free, free equals worth zero, as far as I'm concerned. Um, that doesn't mean all of your training should be for a fee. It, all, it could mean that some training is free and some training is a fee. Um, so those are some ideas and there's no perfect answer to it, Brent. So I hope that addresses th that question a little bit, gives people some ideas. It, it does. And I think, uh, you know, with the, the uh, couple hundred people we have on the line here, if any of you have other ideas or things that um, you've been working on that have worked to uh, encourage customers to engage with your training resources, add those in the chat window. We'll, we'll get back to those uh, after Bill has gone through the steps here. Um, yes, for sure. And even if, even if it's Bill, you're wrong. I've done exactly the opposite of what you just said and it worked for me great. Type that in too. Yeah, we'd all love right. to hear all those, all those ideas. Okay, Brent, let's go to step one, shall we? Do it. All right. It's easy, <laughs> it's, you know, it's easy to say, Brent, it's easy to say, hey, just go set a goal. You know, I want to lose five pounds or I want to improve our renewal rates or I'm going to launch a new course at the end of this quarter. The problem is there's lots of goals we could chase. So if any of you are like me, you get distracted by the shiny squirrel in the room and are chasing that thing all around and you can't decide on one thing and pick it. But this is part of what our problem is with goal setting is that there are many things that we could chase. So I wonder from you all in the audience, if you're looking at the slide, do some of these relate? Are some of these relatable? Because education could have an impact on all of these. So, the, so you have to actually, I'm advocating and telling you, as if you'll listen to me, you have to pick one or two. You have to pick the fewest number of these and just focus on that until you make a, uh, a habit out of it, until you make an improvement on it. Uh, before you move on to the next thing. Because if you try to chase 10 things at once, you're essentially chasing nothing. And I want to take you through this approach where it's one thing to come up with an education goal, but if it's not in balance or in alignment with what the company is trying to do, then it's just a lot of work. It's just working hard. And it might not be working hard on the right thing. It's like that Roy Rogers quote, even if you're on the right track, if you're standing still, you're going to get run over. It's, it's kind of like that. You have to be on the right track and be going forward in order to move that train. So one approach, and I wonder if this happens to you, the CEO just comes into the room or the executive team is sort of a metaphor for the management team. They just, they just say, 
this is our number one priority or go run in that direction really fast. And we just take that and we just run with it. And that may or may not be the best approach. And, and though in the moment, it's difficult to imagine us saying to the CEO, that's not the best approach. We should go in this direction. Um, on the other hand, that is one way to align your education goals with what the business wants. And simply by setting an education goal that aligns with whatever the CEO said on Friday. And of course, that's a difficult thing to do, but that's one approach to take. If you really want to be smart about it, uh, and let me be your coach for a minute, don't just react to the CEO every time they say something because they said it. I know we all do that sometimes, but I want, to, I want us all to try not to do that and to take an approach like that's on this slide here. You want to sort of an, a, analyze the overlaps between what the customer needs are, what the business needs, and by business needs, I mean what the CEO says or the executive team, and how that overlaps with what you can actually deliver with the resources and skills and capabilities you have as an education team. So for example, if all three of these overlap, it's easy. You can go home early and have a nice dinner because you're going to focus your education goals on addressing all three of these things because you're capable of doing it, the business needs it, and so do your customers. The question becomes, what happens when your CEO says something and the business needs something, except that does not overlap with what the customer needs and what you can actually deliver with what you have? That's going to be a tough choice, but I'm suggesting to you that you ignore the CEO. And I'm smiling when I say that because that's not easy to do. And maybe you really shouldn't do that. But honestly, you really should ignore the CEO and say, no, 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 we're not going to deliver on that because of we can go through the reasons. And the reasons include, hey, with our current capabilities and resources and what the customer is telling us that they need, we can deliver and we're going to deliver what the customer needs. And we're going to have to, you're going to have to wait for that. Or you can have a grown-up conversation and say that I, we don't have, if, if you want me to also deliver on what you want, CEO, then let's talk about, or management team or whoever you report to, let's talk about what resources we need to make that happen. So now you have some model for having the discussion about whether we do it. And your executive team might say, you know what, I think you're right. Go deliver on the customer needs. We can wait a quarter. I see what you mean. Uh, this model makes sense to me and go for it. But at least you could have that negotiation. So when we have this negotiation and we want to set our goals, let's take some examples. So let's say that the CEO has said our number one goal this year is to increase revenue by 50% for this year. So now if you're very good at what you do as an education leader, you want to put some things in place to help achieve that, right? You almost to the, to almost ignoring everything else because if the, this is the number one priority, you want to make the maximum contribution to that with education. So this is how you might set your goal in education. Maybe your goal is to create a new private training course that AEs can attach to deals that maybe they are high price private training for your largest enterprise customers. Because maybe Citibank buys from you and they expect to pay for training when they sign up for you. And so let's sell 12 of those deals this quarter or in the next six months to help improve revenue. There's, that's just one example. You know, you could do training on, pro, on additional modules of your product that could turn into upsells of the product. The point is the education goal needs to align with this increase in revenue goal. Okay, so then what is... What if your number one goal at your company is renewal rates? Because you're at the point where renewal revenue is exceeding the new revenue. And so renewal rates are everything. And maybe our renewal rates aren't quite as high as they should be. Maybe they're 87% or maybe they're 93%. And, and CEO said, increase to 95%. Well, maybe your education goal should attack that in particular. And what about doing setting a goal to get people trained on unused sticky features and the reason people aren't renewing is because they don't know about this console and your product that would help them do something monumentally better i mean if your software does promise to disrupt how they do business and impact their and impact their financial statements in some way then maybe the training should address those particular things 
in the quest of helping customers say, I can't live without the software. We are definitely going to renew because I just learned how to use this new function in the software. Or maybe I just learned how to achieve this outcome by using that new function in the software. That's the ideal. Okay, so finally, what if the goal is to reduce onboarding time? I'm sure many of you are responsible for onboarding new customers. And maybe some of you think, oh my gosh, it should not take this long. It takes six weeks. I should be able to onboard people in three weeks. But let's just say your company wants to reduce that time because time is money and I can get to the next customer, right? Maybe our education goals should be targeted at the onboarding process. Maybe we make training a mandatory step of onboarding and step two, maybe it's the first or second step you do. And maybe our goal is to get 75 new customers through this training in the next quarter and then measure the time to onboard, uh, however you define that, and see if that goes down. But the point here is aligning the goal with the business, it's not just setting a goal. Anybody could set a goal. We all read what a smart goal is. That's not hard. But what's important is picking the education goal, which specifically attacks something on the left here. That's all I'm saying. So Brent, we can pause here if there are any questions, but I just want to pose a homework for everyone is I want you to go through the exercise of doing something in two columns, listing your company goals on the left and what education goals you could come up with to address those on the, on the right. So and we, Bill, we have a, uh, several great examples from the previous question asked. So I'd love to see some answers, uh, know some brave souls willing to share what they think their goals might be um, oh yeah in the chat as well that would be great if they do we'll stop and address those otherwise let's just keep going so we be on time step two is to assess your current state um, so it's funny I've, I've asked you all to set a goal first before you even know if you could do anything and that's a little bit on on purpose because you know until we set a goal we're not scared enough to actually do anything that's kind of my attitude about it. Um, but the second step in this design process is to assess the current state of what you can do. And so a maturity model is a, is a useful tool for this. And what's useful about using a maturity model is not only assessing the current state, so maybe you're looking at this and you're saying to yourself, oh yeah, that's me, I am in the reacting stage. You know, I, I, everything is a fire drill. I'm reacting to everything. I can't reuse everything. Everything is a custom build for training because every customer is special and I can't get out of it. Um, the, the, but the other useful part of a maturity model is looking at the stages beyond and over to the right and saying, you know what, I would love to get to a scaling stage or I would love to get to performing. In other words, you can look at this and, and have some aspirations and then pick where you want to go next. Because uh, by picking where you want to go next, it helps set up our third stage of developing a roadmap for how to get there. Um, you may also decide after looking at something like this to say, hey, I better adjust our goals because we're at a reacting stage. We don't even have anyone with a title of educate with the, the word education in their title. We can't possibly deliver on the goal we would love to help do. So maybe I have to go back and either adjust the goal or we need to adjust our roadmap and get the resources we need. But Using a maturity model like this can help you do two things, know where you are as objectively as possible, but also um, have some aspirations for where you could head. And that's where the roadmap comes in because, you know, your current state is this person standing on, just standing here, right? That's my current state. And I'm trying to get to this end state of some future mature state where I'm really uh, a, a much higher performing education function because of what I put into place. And developing a roadmap is a way to do that. So I want you to think about what your stage might be. And we covered that very briefly, but um, you can make a note about what your stage might be, but also what stage you aspire to be. Because if I go back here real quick, just because you're at a reacting or performing stage of some kind, you don't have to go all the way to an optimizing stage because depending on your company, your company stage, depending on your culture, depending on uh, the philosophy of your business, you may not get here, right? Where you're doing $60 million a year in education revenue and it's a team of 42 people and you have even, you have multiple VPs of education running different 
um, specific lines of business. It could be perfectly, you could be perfectly happy going from a reacting to a performing stage because performing stage, if it's, even if it's not perfect, it's a good place to be. And so the point is you don't have to go through all of these. You can pick one and only go one step if you want to. In other words, you have the power to decide that is my point. So once we get to step three, this is where I believe that people who are responsible for education can make an enormous improvement in credibility in the business by using a roadmap approach to how they're going to build an education function. Because now we need to talk about laying out a map for how we're going to get to this future state. Because if we review what we've done so far, we have set some goal and aligned it specifically what the business cares about. And that goal might take us five years to, to get to. I mean, depending on how you want to set your goals. Um, but we've set this goal and we've committed to ourselves, hey, we're going to attack the specific needs that the company cares about most. That could be revenue growth. That could be renewal rates. It could be NPS. It could be whatever those are. Um, the second thing we did was we took an honest assessment of our, uh, of our function. But now we're getting into the details of how do we execute on our plan. And the thing about a roadmap is, um, you know, we many of us, roadmap gives us an ability to look out into the future, even if we don't know all the details. And the thing about that is many of us are very bad at estimating what we can achieve in the short run. In other words, we think we could do a thousand things this quarter, and yet we hardly ever can do all of that. But we drastically underestimate what we can achieve in the long run if we just take small steps. And so I am kind of look at this as a roadmap that helps us take, uh, I don't know if it's baby steps or incremental steps or one step at a time, because if we do a lot of one steps at a time in two or three or four years, we've done an enormous amount of work. And a roadmap helps us sort of map that out and not, well, maybe not always, but tries to help us not overcommit to everything in the quarter, which we know we can't do. Like none of us can sit here and say, of course, CEO, we could deliver a certification program by Q, end of Q2, and that's two and a half months away. That's impossible. And I don't care how smart or how many hours you work, a proper certification program could take 18 months. So we have to be realistic about it. But what we can do is deliver one part of that certification program in the quarter. Maybe it could be making the decision. Well, I'll get into some details here in a second. So we could develop one part of that. And then in Q4, we could develop another part of that. Maybe we can deliver a pilot program in six months and test it on 20 customers before we... So there's ways to, uh, to do that. And there's this great quote by Pete Childers. Um, from Couchbase, and he has said repeatedly that he finds he can do about one big project a year. And he doesn't say that, uh, I'm kind of joking when I say this, but it's not like he's saying he's lazy, I'm going to do one thing and then leave me alone. He doesn't do other things. But one big initiative a year and over four years, what you can build up is, is a staggering education business. And he's, you know, Couchbase trains customers all over the world, live and in person and on demand and, um, and with, with interactive documentation and all that. Uh, Sherry Quinn from Atlassian tells a similar story. She built Atlassian University up, uh, which is a huge, has a huge major certification program, certifying partners and customers. Uh, but she built this thing over time, almost in the same way that Pete Childers did, like one major project every year, starting with live training, then on demand, then certifications, then partner training, then customer training. And it's like this one step at a time. And even if they weren't using this roadmap approach that I'm suggesting, in effect, they did use a roadmap approach because they knew they needed to get to the certain end state. And that what they tried not to do is commit to doing it in a quarter and then not delivering. So what I am suggesting is that once you get to this third stage in your design process is that you map out, you know, how are we going to get to the goal we set? 
And if we're at this certain maturity stage, what do we need to put in place to get to a, a higher level of maturity so that we can get to the stage? But how do we lay out our five-year plan for education? And maybe you don't go out five years, um, but you, you want to break up your plan. And I want to suggest to you that there are three reasons why you need a roadmap. First of all, um, it's going to improve your credibility. Your product team and your executive team is going to be impressed that an education team or even a, any CSM team uses a roadmap approach to build out their projects uh, because it's not typical with teams like that. Um, but the number one reason you need to have a roadmap is so that you personally know where you're going. You have this map, this piece of paper that says in Q1, we're going to do this. And in year three, we're going to deliver that. And even if you don't know the details, and even if you don't know how you're gonna do it, you at least have this vision of how you're going to get there. But the second reason you need a roadmap, and so that gives you peace of mind. If you know what you're going to deliver on a year from now, broadly speaking, it's easier to put things in place to help you get there. But the second reason I want you to take a roadmap approach is so that you can communicate. You can go into the executive team at any, at any moment, you, you bring in your piece of paper or you send them a link to your Confluence page and you say, here's our roadmap, here's where we're headed. And in fact, we're right here right now where I'm pointing to my Q3 slide. Like we're just about to send out the new on-demand training catalog um, and people are signing up, whatever. We're here where we are. So this is a way of you communicating, here's what we planned to do and here's where we are and here are our gaps. Now, the, so communicating to stakeholders is also why I need a roadmap. The third reason you want a roadmap is for the inevitable changes to life, not the least of which is your CEO coming to you and saying, I need you to create a whole new program. We're about to start selling to enterprises, the Fortune 100, and they're going to need drastically different whatever. I want you to go crazy with that. And I want your plan on my desk in a month or whatever that is quickly. Uh, you can, instead of just reacting and, you know, lighting your hair on fire and getting stressed out and checking your blood pressure, you can say, okay, here's our roadmap. This is what we planned. You want to introduce this new thing. We're happy to do some swaps. We'll swap them some things out. We'll put a plan together. We can do this. And if your CEO says, no, you can't not do that thing in Q4, uh, you have to do both. You can say, okay, fine, well, then we need more resources because this is our plan and, you, and, and, and all that. But by showing the, you can communicate and negotiate and discuss plans. But it also gives you a little bit of peace of mind to say, to, re, to react to that urgent request from the executive team to do this new thing that wasn't planned for. You can go back to the roadmap and you can say, okay, we do some swapping around. And sometimes they might not like that. And sometimes you do the swapping anyway and you just don't tell them and you deliver what they want and everybody's happy. Um, but um, when you use a roadmap to communicate, you can also, because product teams do this all the time, right? Where they reprioritize their roadmap and some things that you think is on there, or they, they just never get to and that release never happens. I mean, you know that. The same approach can happen with your team, but see, this gives you a framework for having those discussions, which is why I love this approach so much. So, we're coming to the end and I'm, I'm just about to, re, I'm, we're gonna review the three steps, but. Uh, and, and Brent, I'm happy to take questions uh, now if there are some, but I want to tell a story. What? Oh, go ahead. Let's, um, let's do stop for just a second here because there's a couple of great things. Um, part of what I want to do is address some of the ideas that have been shared in the chat. Um, okay. And, uh, you know, I, I found it instructive that you started off talking about defining strategy and now here you are ending with uh, breaking it down into these small goals. Now, um, one question asked by Daniel was, what is the most near-term result that's achievable through customer training? And I think that's gonna vary by each customer, but would you say yeah. it's important to pick a starting point or maybe a, a first win, a first? Yes. That uh, that's actually a very good question. And just let me go back to this slide here. Um, yes, I would go for a quick win, but I would want to make sure it addresses 
whatever the top priority is on the left. So don't, in other words, if the company cares about a certain thing, let's say it's just take the increased revenue as the goal. That's the number one priority. Your quick win could be sell one course for, for 500 bucks. That can be done in a short amount of time. Maybe you already have a course, maybe it's free, and maybe you change the price, and maybe you get someone to buy it, as an example. So, um, you know, your goal, so in this set, in this case, I set a goal of let's create a new course in general and start charging for it, right? But maybe it's an existing course, and you, maybe you want to sell it once. So yes, I definitely think you should break it down and have a near term and a quick win, because that's a way of testing the market. And especially for a lot of software companies that don't want to charge for training because the belief is it's a service. It should be part of the you know, SaaS software as a service and services are all the other things. Um, so you might be afraid to sell your training, but if the goal is increasing revenue, well, hello, training people, Red Hat used to make $60 million a year in training revenue. Hello, I didn't do it for free. So, um, it doesn't have, it could be free and that's fine, but it doesn't have to be is the point. And if the number one goal is revenue, maybe you as an education team want to do that. But yes, as long as it's in the context of one of these top goals of your executive team, then go for the quick win, the $1, the one point in renewal rates, the one day shorter onboarding because you uh, added training to the onboarding process. So yes. Are there others, Brent? Yeah, there's several. Um, and uh, the next one here is around gamification. Mm -hmm. uh, we have several people who have commented about the role of gamification and, uh, um, and or awards or recognitions or certifications as well. Do you have some comments on the role of gamification in the education process? Uh, yes, I think that uh, the, the gamification could mean a lot of things. And although if we break it down, looking at our customers and what they want, at, at a minimum, you can imagine our customers want to learn a new skill that they could put on their resume and say to the world, I am capable of using this technology and therefore that makes me more valuable. Now, that could mean that you then use some form of recognition, and I use that word a little bit broadly, to help a customer share that with the world. So maybe that's not gamification directly. Like I, 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 I'm not an expert enough or, or educated enough to know whether leaderboards matter and whether 12 points for one course gets me um, to a certain, I, I become a new level of skill and whatever. But I will say that people want to become certified in some technology that's valuable to put on their resume, to click here, to share on my LinkedIn profile and add it to my skills list. And here's a copy of the badge or a copy that I could put on my personal website or a copy of the certificate of completion, right? There's a whole, that, because maybe you're not at this stage yet, but you can imagine an entire industry of Microsoft and, and Red Hat and Cisco and uh, I don't know, there, there's got to be others uh, that are escaping me, where if I want a Cisco certified you know, network engineer, that acronym goes on every job description and people uh, submit those to those jobs and say, I have the certified network engineer from Cisco. And it's a whole industry of I'm only going to hire people with that credential and only the people who apply for that have that credential and now you have people that don't have the credential that go to the Cisco website to sign up and pay for to get that credential so that they could be more valuable and get a job. So um, I don't think I answered the question specifically about gamification, but the helping people achieve a skill that they can share and they can put on their resume, depending on the, your technology, I think it's a big deal and every software company should be doing that because if, I mean, look, if your software company has really built a product, and I've said this before earlier, if you've really built a product that is trying to disrupt an industry and it's a new technology and it's changing the way a business operates and businesses are going to want to buy it from you, they also need people capable of using it. And so if you can help people say, I am capable of using that new fancy technology, 
then you're doing a service for your customers, uh, you know, the end users and the customers and all that. So I would definitely help figure out a way to help people do that. It's very valuable. And I think that does answer uh, the question, um, at least, the, and there have been three or four at least uh, in our chat window. So um, why don't you uh, wrap up as you're going to, and then we'll close with some more comments and another question or two. Okay, I just want to you know, uh, finish with a story that comes from a Jim Collins book, this Great by Choice book, and he, he talks about, and this is sort of in line with the roadmap, it talks about two expeditions to South America. One expedition decided to do 20 miles a day. And he calls this the 20 mile march. They decided we're gonna do 20 miles a day on a, on a nice weather day in, in South America. You might have been able to cover 20 miles by lunchtime. And that particular expedition stopped for the day and they rested and they got their gear together and they played cards and they fed the dogs and all that. And they went out the next day. And when the next day was bad weather, they were rested and they got through it, even if it took them till five o'clock that evening to get there. Well, that expedition made it to the South Pole because they did 20 miles a day no matter what. The second expedition that went at a similar time decided on a sunny day, hey, we'll do 50 miles. It's only noon. Let's keep going. We're fresh. We're healthy. Let's go. Now, the next day came and it was a blizzard and a storm and 100 mile an hour winds and the usual South America weather. And that team was tired. And if you're tired, why would you go out in that weather? So they took the day off. And then a day off became two days off. And now they're behind schedule. And that expedition never made it to the, to, the, to the South Pole. So I'm encouraging you, it's my call to action to you, to design your strategy. But when you create your roadmap, get those small wins and get those consistent wins and, and put those and be realistic about what you could achieve in every quarter or every month or every whatever and march towards a place where four years from now, you have an education program that's semi-automated and organized and, and you've been promoted to VP of education and you have a team of four people. And when a customer needs training, you can say, no problem, here it is. You know, nothing's perfect, but that's the idea. Yeah, I want you to go on your 20 mile march, one bit at a time every day. And so Brent, I'll just leave this slide up. This is sort of the review of three steps. Slide up and we could take uh, you know, a couple of more questions if we want to. Awesome, and I'd like to reiterate a couple of things that I've heard you say that I think are um, just great. One was yeah. the idea that you mentioned of charging for training. And that may look a little different for depending on your type of product and your customer, but I think that's a wonderful idea. Um, any more comments about charging for training? And you're asking me that? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Um, first of all, it's not a charge for training or free training discussion. It's a continuum, right? Um, I'll just give you an example. Um, if a customer wants you to come on site and fly to New York to their headquarters in front of their team of 20 administrators to deliver a custom training to them because they've configured your software in a special way, that should cost money. That should be 10,000 bucks a day plus the hourly rate of, 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 edit, of, of customizing the training course for them and they should pay for travel, no doubt about that. Even if that's the same topic that they could have learned on the self-paced video that's on your website, that video should be free, right? And you could have both. And for some customers that, oh, I can't afford that, you say, that's fine, here's a video that shows you how to you know, set up your, do your user provisioning, no problem. Now, you don't get the value of having someone come on site and having an expert in the room and being able to ask questions and in the context of how you work. Um, now you can also have something in the middle where you do a, a virtual live instructor training. So you still have the instructor, but it's someone who is online with WebEx or GoTo training or Zoom or whatever. And that maybe that costs a hundred dollars per person. And a different customer wants to pay different things and wants a different level of service. And that doesn't mean you force all your customers to pay the ten thousand dollars a day, but what it does mean is for customers that want it, here you go. For customers that don't want that, they want something else, you could say, here you go. And you could take the same course topic. Let's take your administrator course. Let's say you have one that teaches an administrator how to you know, configure your software. You could have four or five or six different versions of that content on the same topic. And some of it can be free and some of it could be 10,000 bucks a day and some of it could be 100 bucks 
uh, per customer for a three hour course and everything in between. And you have a continuum of value and choices for customers and it's really as the same topic. So that's what I would say about pricing. You can do free and paid and you should. Excellent, excellent, great. And based on the comments in the chat window, um, there's a lot of, uh, uh, that's very relevant to our audience today. And then last thing that I wanted to comment on, uh, when talking about Fender guitars, you made what I thought was a very important uh, point. You said the lessons are not designed to teach the features of the guitar, right. they're designed to help people play the music they want. Any yes. closing comments on that concept? Well, imagine if Salesforce, now Salesforce is a little bit different, but, um, you know, because they have partner networks and all this stuff, but Salesforce could have become the number one leading provider of training on how to be good at sales, right? And instead of Richardson or these other you know, consulting companies that do this, because if they sell a software that helps people sell better, because why buy a CRM or something called Salesforce than to help your sales, that's the point, then um, you could have done, and you should, probably, I argue Salesforce should have done this. The training should have been about how do I sell better, oh, by the way, using this software, not about how do I click create new contact, and then here's how you type in the first name, and here's where you type in the, the last name, and all that, um, because just because I buy Salesforce and I know how to create, you know, add a new contact does not mean I know how to sell better. And so if I don't sell better after I buy the software, why would I renew? I wouldn't. And so um, what Salesforce should have done, in my opinion, is teach, and this is what all of you should do, you should help your customers do that thing they've hired your software to help them do the outcome. In other words, I don't use my fitness pal to press buttons on my phone and to learn how to swipe on my phone. I get my fitness pal so I can lose 10 pounds. So they should help me lose 10 pounds, right? Or get to the gym. And oh, by the way, I can, the app will help me do that. So I would, um, I would design more training that's more outcome focused, helping customers achieve that outcome. The reason they bought your software in the first place. Awesome. Well, thank you, Bill, and uh, thank you, everybody. We've had a tremendous amount of conversation in the chat window. Uh, we thank you for your questions. Bill, it's been very instructive, and uh, your uh, three-step um, way to outline these goals and, and build a strategy and a roadmap is uh, just wonderful. As we mentioned previously, a recorded version of this webinar will be emailed to you. Client Success is here to help. We are incredibly passionate about helping you deliver value for customers through customer success processes. And because of our passion, we've built industry leading technology to help you. We have many other resources available and I highly recommend visiting the client success blog for more information on education and, and many other topics as well. So big thank you to you, Bill, and to all of our attendees. And we will talk to you again next month. Thank you, Brent. Thanks, Bill, and thanks everyone.